The epidemic of addiction impacts older adults in many ways. A growing number have a substance abuse disorder themselves, whether due to using illicit drugs and alcohol or misusing prescription medication, intentionally or not. But sometimes we overlook the indirect damage from substance abuse. This program will discuss how that collateral damage impacts older adults and their families. We have several guests who will help us understand these issues, starting with one that is upending the lives of many older adults who become caregivers for children of addicted relatives. Joining me is Grace Smith with the Council on Aging of Middle Tennessee. Thank you for joining us, Grace. Thank you for the invitation. So how many people in Tennessee are affected by addiction and assuming the role of a caregiver of a child because of an addicted parent? It's a growing number, but the Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disability estimates that 77,000 grandparents are raising grandchildren who are living with them. Nationwide, it's at least 2.6 million. The opioid crisis has brought more attention to the issue of grandparents um, raising grandchildren, but it's certainly those numbers are growing because of opioid addiction. Okay, and, and we should clarify that um, it's easy to describe it as grandparents raising grandchildren, but it can be any number of relatives who might be in this role, correct? Absolutely, it could be. And in fact, we've started hearing from some of our partners that there are more elderly great-grandparents raising great-grandchildren. So I think it could be an aunt or uncle, it can be a grandparent situation, it can be great or great-great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we need to look at the broader spectrum of family members that that need to step in because of an addiction issue. These are situations where the parents are still around, but they've gotten in trouble somehow. Either they have become uh, uh, addicted and are using uh, substance or abusing substances, mm -hmm. or they may be incarcerated. So how does that make a difference when grandparents are trying to take care of these children? It makes a difference emotionally because you're worried about your child who is um, the adult child. the adult child uh, who is addicted. You also um, the issue of legal issues and custody can become um, complicated. And one of the first things that we recommend is to get a power of attorney for a minor child so that you do have some legal rights when. Um, being with them in the healthcare system or navigating the school system. Until you have that power of attorney document, those records will not be released to you or you will not be able to make certain decisions. So we always recommend um, that anyone in a custody situation seek out some professional legal advice to know what documentation needs to be in place and, um, and what the various aspects of custody issues can be. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we did have an opportunity to um, meet with some folks who are older adults who are taking care of children of addicted relatives. Um, they are part of a support group with Family and Children's Services. And here's what some of them had to say. I'm caring for my two granddaughters my youngest son's uh, daughters. I have my granddaughter, which is my oldest son's child. She's nine years old. He was four weeks old. His, uh, his father was already incarcerated. His mother was going to be, and she had taken him downtown to the state building to give him up. And I'm caring for my granddaughter. I went and picked her up five years ago right after school, and I've had her ever since. I never thought that I would be caring for grandchildren. I just assumed that I would just get to spoil them and send them home. I love to travel. Let me go wherever, you know, let me just jump on a plane and jump in my car and just drive and go someplace. But then I felt that these girls really need me. I love to cook. I used to own a restaurant. This little girl loves to eat. What's for supper, Granny? Granny, did you cook today? 
Uh, she has me working, you know. I didn't know what it was to spend a hundred dollars in the grocery store. I miss a lot, and especially with my husband, I let him go head on because she's in school. We gotta worry about somebody getting her, or we have to take her out of school. So I miss this a lot. How do you deal with being the grandparent of being older? Like my uh, granddaughter told me that sometimes they get teased about not living with their parents. I know you live with your grandma because I saw her, and she an old grandma too. <laughs> I guess they see me coming with the cane and everything. Here come Gra uh, Rayana's granny. Rayana, here come your granny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think she's as embarrassed as I am. <laughs> they said, Tayshawn, is that your mama or your grandma? Which one? You know. And so he'll he'll look. He won't say anything, and I say, I'm his God sent mom. Is all I say to them. When you have uh, the drugs and the alcohol in the family, do you tell them that their mother's on drugs? I think what we do as caretakers, we want to not let them face the reality of what is actually really there, and we try to cover it up. So the best teacher is dialoguing with them. Sit them down, how do you feel? And how can I help? Ask them how we can help them instead of us thinking that we're helping. It's just so sad when you see the children of today going through what they are going through. Some children just never get over it. What is the Council on Aging doing to help folks find resources for dealing with some of these things? Our mission is really to identify unmet needs and then develop solutions. So about five years ago, when we started hearing about more grandparents raising grandchildren, we realized that there was, there was no guidebook on how to do that. Um, there was no place that you could go for information and find, find out about the legal, financial, emotional issues, about childhood development. So we brought together a number of volunteers who were experts on this um, whole realm of, grant, of caring for dependent children and put together a resource guide called Empowering Grandparents. Okay. And this is one place where you can find the legal medical issue. We included information on different stages of childhood development and what children need at those stages, how to discipline at those stages. Mm -hmm. We included information on technology what is Snapchat? What is Facebook? You know, what ages are appropriate for these and how do you provide the supervision of technology? Um, and how to take care of yourself as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. So all of this information was put into this guidebook and last year we updated it and made it available online as well. One thing that I heard a lot was people saying, well, because I'm a relative, because I'm a grandparent, I don't get the same acknowledgement from state agencies, local agencies, organizations, um, as someone who might be providing foster care or a non-relative and also don't get the financial support. I don't think we're doing a great job of recognizing this group of caregivers and giving them access to the support they need. So I think there's advocacy work to be done. Um, I do think that because of the work of AARP and Generations United and a number of organizations that are bringing attention to grandparents raising grandchildren, we're starting to see improvements. But there is more advocacy work to be done because they cannot always access the benefits and the services they need. Well, we're grateful that the Council on Aging is doing its part, and Grace, thank you so much for joining us and helping us to understand this issue. The Guide for Grandparents Raising Grandchildren is available for free through the Council on Aging of Middle Tennessee. Addiction is a family issue. When someone is in active or even recovering addiction, their family is also in addiction. At least that's how my next guest views it. 
Kate Daniels is an author and professor of creative writing at Vanderbilt University. She has written two books of poems about how addiction affects families. Thanks for joining us, Kate. Thank you for having me. So tell me what inspired you to tackle this in, in your literary works. Well, like a, um, a lot of American families, um, addiction has been a factor in my family history for quite a long time. Um, my, in fact, my 49-year-old brother, my baby brother, died of severe alcoholism uh, about 10 years ago. Um, numerous other close family members um, have been affected by it, including my own family. And that was what caused me to uh, be in a crisis situation such that I needed um, some kind of group therapy support, which I found in Al-Anon. But in, I'm a poet. I write. I write from an autobiographical place. I've always written out of the immediacy and of my life, whatever's happening. When I was having my children, I was writing about being pregnant and having babies. <laughs> when I was young and in love and getting married, I wrote about that. Now I'm old, I'm writing about getting aging. So this was something that came out of my life that was not something to celebrate, but something that, that was necessary and had to be processed, I felt, through my writing. Um, in, in looking at some of the poems you've written, um, one thing that really comes through is um, the need to address stigma and mm -hmm. stereotyping mm -hmm. um, and the idea that some people have that this is a moral failure that we're talking about. Tell me a little bit about what you're trying to convey yeah. about those yeah. issues. Well, I think an, uh, most people maybe have that idea, that unfortunate idea that addiction and alcoholism is a failure of will, it's a moral a flaw, a character failing. Um, but of course, modern medicine does not believe that to be true. Um, it be, turns into a brain disorder. It's something that changes your brain. Um, it's but an society illness. hasn't really caught up with society that. Society has not caught up at all with that. So one of the things that writing does is that it causes you to dip into your own what shall we call them, internal narratives, the stories that you tell yourself, not just about yourself, but about the world in, at large. Um, it has seemed to me that um, if we can catch up to modern medicine and the way that it understands addiction and what causes people to become addicted, that we might be better able as a society to address the terrible problems that we're having right now, for instance, with the opioid epidemic, with so many hundreds of thousands of people who have died and the millions of family members and friends who've been affected critically by that. Mm -hmm. So if you can, we can tell a different story to ourselves, then we can begin to act in different ways. And writing, I, I believe that. Mm -hmm. And writing is one way that, that we can try to do that. Okay, I'd like to hear some of your works. Uh, there were a couple of poems that you wanted to share with us. Can you read those? Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> the first one I'll read um, is from a little collection called Three Syllables Describing Addiction. And it's a general poem about what's going on in the midst of the heroin epidemic. When I heard the news that Cynthia's daughter had died all alone, slumped over on the ground beside a dumpster behind the convenience store where she'd made her final buy, I logged off and walked outside to look at the water before I could think too much. It's become a habit now, losing myself in the soothing image of moving water before the headlines and the stats start blaring out the way they do, performing themselves inside my mind that has always imagined too vividly too much. You think too much, my parents always said, but thinking about this or not thinking won't reverse the events that have captured Cynthia or bring back the daughter who's been carried away in the opening chapter of a terrible plot. Addicts destroy themselves. That's just where we start. And why they might have wanted to, or if it was an accident, is beside the point. The aftermath is what's at stake. The human flotsam captured in addiction's filthy wake. Ordinary citizens like Cynthia, with her stone face and her dead blue eyes, single mother of one child deceased. I'm sure a lot of older adults find themselves relating to a poem like that because they have an adult child that, like you said, they've were raised and they may be prone to enable who's dealing with that. 
I go to a group that's all women, so there are lots of mothers in the room. And this is a constant topic of our conversation. How do we understand our role as mothers, as caregivers, as the giver of life when we have a child? Um, or a spouse, or a sibling, or a parent, but it's particularly fraught, as I said, for children. Um, how do we understand our role? What is the way that we help them? In my opinion, addiction cannot be overcome by an addict by themselves. And I don't believe that when you're in relation to a, an addict that you're capable of, of, of getting into recovery or dealing with it by yourself. I think you need a community, you need group, you need support. And to that end, you have started some writing groups, and, and I'm sure that's in part to address what you just said. Tell us about that. So for about a year and a half now, I've been running, um, facilitating writing workshops called Writing for Recovery. They're directed at people whose lives have been affected by other people's addictions, not at addicts themselves. I'm Luckily, I don't have the brain chemistry for addiction. I've never had that problem. But I do know what it's like to have a family member, a close family member, who is suffering with addiction and alcoholism. So that's what I do. And um, The Porch, which is Nashville's literary community, and one of our greatest cultural resources here in Nashville, um, facilitates these workshops. So I run them under their auspices. And this is open to anyone who fits that description, that they yes. have a relative yes. who is in addiction. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And they're small groups. Um, I give them prompts. Everything is completely completely non-coercive. We're not graded. It's not a class. People are free to share if they want, if they just want to come and, and soak in whatever else is happening. Um, you know, they can do that. But everyone actually does write, and everyone is, is eager to write. Uh, it's a, you know, I, I um, design it as a safe space. We all agree to confidentiality. That's the only thing I ask them to agree to, so that we don't talk about what goes on specifically outside or share work or any, with anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite amazing. Some groups get very close um, in the course of about a month when we meet. So. Well, it sounds like a wonderful service that you're providing to help folks who are dealing with this issue. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your works sure. with us. And we'll make the information about how to participate available on our website. One of the challenges for families dealing with addiction is how to talk with each other about the changes and emotions it brings. That becomes even more difficult when young children are involved. Joining me is Trish Healy Luna, the co-author of a book to help children talk about and understand family addiction. Thanks for being here, Trish. Thanks for having me. Tell me what sparked your interest in writing a children's book about this. Well, it started because it was my family story. Mm -hmm. um, my children were very young and their father was addicted to cocaine. Mm -hmm. And I needed something to speak to my children about what was happening in their lives. And as a young parent, I read to my children every day uh, about every, everything that was happening in their lives. And when addiction is happening in a family, that sort of takes over the whole family dynamic. So I went to the library, I went to bookstores, this is before Google, mm -hmm. and there was nothing available for me to read to the children. And here we read about bedtime fears and sharing and so many other subjects that impacted their life, but there was nothing on the most important subject. So I sort of took matters into my own hands and wrote a little story in rhyme and it was originally called My Daddy Has a Problem and it was so I could read it to my two kids. Mm -hmm. And over time you kind of set that aside for a few years because yeah, you weren't really years, getting a lot of encouragement. Right. So when we tried to have or when I tried to have it published nobody wanted to talk about this issue and they were saying most especially with young children and that was just so counterintuitive to me because this is who needs it so just because something bad is happening in a child's life by not talking about it doesn't make it go away doesn't solve it and certainly doesn't help them how much of this do you think relates to our attitudes at that time about substance abuse because it was much more punitive. It was much more judgmental and critical um, as opposed to how it is now. 
Sure. I, I mean, I think there's a lot more awareness now with compassion about addiction and recovery. There's a lot more understanding about it being truly a family disease. I still feel like there's a lot of stigma about addiction, but it's wonderful to see people being more open and talking about that we need to just talk about this. And it's the same if you had diabetes, if you had heart disease, if you had some kind of cancer, you aren't labeled as a terrible person because you have this disease. But that certainly was not what was happening in 1989. Okay. Well, let's talk about how this has evolved. Okay. Let's talk about the book. What's the name of the book? Uh, the name of the book is Timby Talks About Addiction. And we wanted to be able to reach everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so we just decided to name the little character and I just came up with the name Timby just mm -hmm. standing in my kitchen. I thought it was cute and catchy and sweet. Um, and then we just, we had a lot of feedback on the early editions of this book. We sent it out to counselors, psychiatrists, um, people who work with in foster care. And they just felt that saying the word addiction was important than rather just saying my daddy has a problem. So it would have been, you know, Timby talks about a problem, mm -hmm. but what is that problem? And Timby is, um, could be any child, correct? That's right. Any Absolutely. race, any That's gender. Right. And that was really important for us that uh, Timby be gender neutral and also not have a race, mm -hmm. also, but also not really be a being. He's just his own little person. I mean, people call it a bear, but mm -hmm. okay. So <laughs> you make it with whatever t you need Timby to be. I wrote it with my sister who has a master's in mental health counseling. And Janet was the force that brought really how important it was to try to directly combat the ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. and offer children practical tools that they could use, whether they were alone or with a trusted adult, to to help themselves feel more in control in a chronically stressful situation, which is what's happening when there's addiction in the home. So why don't you read a little bit of okay. it for us? Sure. Sometimes the mixture of feelings I've had get jumbled inside me as sad, bad, and mad. My head starts to hurt and my insides feel tight. That's one way my body says something's not right. It's funny to think of my body this way, but it's actually true. It has something to say. When my body is speaking, I've learned to tune in and find ways to let go of my feelings within. The first thing I've learned that can help me calm down is to take some deep breaths as I sit on the ground. I breathe in, I'm a mountain so tall and so wide. I breathe out, I am still and feel more calm inside. I breathe in like a tree with the roots deep in the ground. I breathe out. I am strong, I feel safe, I feel sound. Something else that can help is to go out and play. It helps me let go of my sad, mad, bad day. I can sing a loud song like a, and dance like a clown. I can go punch my pillow or jump up and down. I can play with my friends or go throw a ball, but not at a person, of course, at a wall. And we've talked to several families as we've worked on this issue, and we've heard from some who aren't necessarily parents who are now dealing with rearing a child who uh, is the child of a parent with an addiction. Let's hear one of those stories now. My name's Holly Buchanan. I'm a tattoo artist. I've been in three magazines, two of them international publications, and I've tattooed outside the country as well. Holly Buchanan was at the top of her craft, traveling the country, when her sister died from an opioid-related overdose in Nashville in February. She had been a user for a long time, and I'd always kind of wondered when, you know, I was going to get that call. She was either going to be in jail for a long time or be dead. Kind of broke my heart to see her go that route, knowing as smart as she was. She had a scholarship to Belmont, you know, she had, you know, a lot going for her. I need these first. Okay. The lady who had called me to inform me about my sister passing, I asked her, I was like, well, do you know if my nephew's okay? Is he, was he there? She's like, oh, well, there was no mention of a child there. Let me call you back. So she had to investigate where he was 
to even find him. And then the day I go pick him up that Sunday, he's not there. We had to go to different locations and then finally found him. It's just someone she was staying with at a drug house and got attached to him, I guess. Who knows what he'd seen over the years or was exposed to or was born with. He seems to be pretty level-headed for being a three-year-old. I can see a lot of behavioral issues that will potentially arise too in the future because of the lifestyle he lived before he was with me. So that's, that's scary to me in knowing that that's the ch bigger challenge I'm gonna face later is that kind of stuff. Trish, we uh, often hear from caregivers of children who um, have parents who are addicted, concerns about the trauma that's caused for the child. So do you address that in Timby Talks? Yes, um, that was really the main purpose of the book. Uh, when a child experiences trauma, it has such a negative impact on their development, and this is again back to the ACEs. And so Timby wants to directly talk to the child about ways that, that they can help themselves or with talking to a trusted adult, get some, a sense of control. And also at the end of the book, Timby just lets the um, child know that about resiliency and with the work that Janet and I did in research for this, we found that those were some key elements that were necessary to help combat those adverse experiences. And the thing that I, I also think this book does is it helps those adults who are the caregivers find an entree to supporting that child because so many people would not know how to start that conversation with a five-year-old or how to talk. So the child and the caregiver can read it together or the child and the parent read it together and then talk about it, right? Right, so that was exactly what you were saying, how we need to find ways to just be able to have the conversation and talk about it to support each other. So the goal of Timby is one of the other things that SAMHSA reported was to help nurture parenting bonds, whether that's the grandparents or the parents with the child, to be able to read the story together because it removes the parent from the addiction. And, and so it's a very non-judgmental, so the parent wouldn't have to feel bad about reading this book with the child about addiction. It, mm -hmm. It's a disease. That is such a wonderful resource for families to have. So uh, I appreciate the well, work that you've you. done. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your work and Tim yeah. B's story mm -hmm. and your thoughts for this program, Trish. Oh, thank you so much. The publications and resources we have discussed are all readily available to help families dealing with addiction. You can get more information from our website at wnpt.org. Thanks for watching.